Thank you uh, for the invitation to join you this morning. I'm delighted to be here. I, um, I come from Kentucky. Um, thanks so much. And um, so in response to the predictions made earlier that you can't make predictions, I'm going to predict that California Chrome will win the Triple Crown. This is an exceptional horse, and unless something really nasty happens, uh, I, I anticipate California Chrome will win. Secondly, politics in Kentucky is always unpredictable. We have some interesting folks that um, run out of that state. I will not predict anything happening in Kentucky on the political end of the spectrum. But I want, um, again, to again thank you for the invitation to join you. And actually, what I'm going to talk about today really follows well with what you just heard. I think there are many things that I'm going to build on that you have heard. Um, but before I do that, I, want, I, I learned, and I did not know this, that there is a street out here called Davis Street. Um, and it's one of uh, Evanston's main arteries, apparently. And um, the police live there, the metro station's there, a lot of restaurants, apparently, as well. What I did not know is that this street was actually named for a gentleman by the name of Dr. Nathan Davis. Uh, Dr. Davis was the founder of the American Medical Association 167 years ago. He was also a leader in the creation of the Northwestern Medical School and one of the first deans of that school as well. A few years later, he had a hand in the Northwestern School of Law. He also was involved in founding Mercy Hospital on South Michigan Avenue, and his Davis Free Dispensary was renamed successfully as the South Side Dispensary, the Montgomery Ward Clinic, and eventually the Northwestern University Medical Clinics. I bring this up and I mention this because this man was quite remarkable. He provided a model for all of us today. His record shows just what difference one person with good ideas can actually make. A lot of energy needed to follow through, but he was a driving force to upgrade medical education, fight quackery in this country, and generally make the practice of medicine better for both physicians and patients. So, that has been the mission of the American Medical Association ever since. The largest physician organization in the United States. Through our House of Delegates, the AMA represents 185 state specialty and subspecialty societies in medicine, the preeminent voice for most of America's physicians. And we use that voice. For more than 160 years, the AMA has played a very large part in shaping the nation's health system. Today, of course, is a significant time. Great change is happening. Technology has made practicing medicine and running a hospital a very, very different from what it was a generation ago. A population that is more diverse, older, more afflicted with chronic disease, and it's changing the way we all are working today. Millions more people on the health insurance rolls have added demands to time and resources we are still trying to understand and deal with on a daily basis, and the costs have spiraled out of control. All of those things were what led to the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, and you heard some comment about that earlier. The law was, and is, the nation's attempt to update health care to match society's needs. More specifically, it is about three things. One, providing higher quality health care, delivering that care more efficiently, and doing so at a lower cost. You heard about young adults up to age 26 staying on their parents' plans. Annual lifetime coverage caps have been eliminated. Insurance companies can no longer cancel <coughs> coverage when someone becomes ill or, char or charge women more than men. I must admit 
that I was not aware until I saw the Affordable Care Act that women were getting charged more for health care <coughs> than our male colleagues. It blew me away. Preventive procedures are part of regular medical care now. Colonoscopies, mammograms, flu shots, very important. How many of you all got a flu shot this year, just out of curiosity? Very, very good. Keep it up. You need to be 100%. No excuse for not getting it. It's a preventable disease, and this is my only public health message I will render. 80% <clears throat> of premium dollars must be spent on patient care instead of CEO bonuses or expensive advertisements. Investments have been made in innovative delivery models, such as ACOs, medical homes, and bundled payments. Now, I understand the prediction here is that the ACOs are going to die, but at least for the time being, they are out there and functional. And despite initial glitches, 8 million Americans have signed up for insurance using state-based insurance exchanges. That's 8 million more Americans who now have health insurance, many for the first time. A couple of weeks ago, the Bureau of Economic Analysis announced that spending on health care has increased since the first of the year, probably, probably in response to the insurance gains under the Affordable Care Act. So that means that people who did not have insurance before are now taking advantage of the opportunity to see a physician, to have a needed surgery, fill prescriptions that were out of reach until now. And in the long run, that is very good news. But it also points out just how far behind the eight ball we are. We've got people out there who have been not getting health care for decades with serious medical problems that must be addressed. A recent survey found that about half of uninsured Americans avoided signing up for coverage under the Affordable Care Act because they felt they could not afford it. Yet only a quarter of those people knew that government subsidies were available. We didn't do a very good job of communicating that to the American people. Another survey, this is one out of UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, found that only two in five Los Angeles community health clinics are ready for the increase in patients that is coming as a result of the ACA, and I suspect they are not alone in this. The problems are real. We all know about them. But think of trying to turn the Queen Mary around with a rowboat. You just simply can't do it very easily. It will take time. And turning around the American health care system is a big job. That is why the AMA has continued its work in Washington since the Affordable Care Act was passed four years ago and continue to work diligently for patients and physicians and the practice and delivery of health care to make sure we are getting it right. Now, I want to spend a few minutes talking about ACOs because they are a key part of the new law, even if they may go away. But when the rules were written, the ACO concept did not work for physicians in this country. The initial rules were so restrictive that most physicians would not have been able to participate. Not a clever idea. In response, the AMA convinced CMS to dramatically revise its rules, to slash the number of quality measures, reduce the financial risk, allow physicians to form ACOs without participation of a hospital, and even provide $170 million in advance payments to help cover startup costs for physician practices. Today, thanks to those efforts, there are about half of the country, 600 ACOs are now uh, physician-led. And we're continuing to work with Congress, work with the administration, to be sure the letter of the law matches the intent of the law. But let me shift gears a little bit now, because I want to spend a few minutes talking about some of our strategic issues, because they're very important in light of what you just heard earlier. A couple of years ago, we launched an action-based strategic plan that addresses three areas of great importance. This was a big change for the AMA. 
This is not just a ring binder on the shelf strategic plan. Many of, of you have seen that and participated in some of those activities. But it was a feet on the ground, projects designed to in fact make significant changes in a short period of time in healthcare in this country. The three areas that we are tackling include number one, the burden of chronic disease. You heard about that. The need to change medical education to meet the realities of 21st century medical practice. And the important issue of how physicians are adapting to changes in practice and payment situations. I'm going to sp speak briefly about the first two, and then I want to spend a little more time talking about the physician, the practice of medicine, and practice sustainability. Let me first talk, though, about diabetes. People say to me, Artis, why is the American Medical Association taking on improving health outcomes for patients? And my thoughtful answer is, why not? These patients, our patients, pass through our offices, our clinics, our emergency departments, our ORs, our radiology departments every day. They are our patients. So we're beginning two of the most pervasive, uh, we recognize two of the most pervasive conditions in this country right now, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So how bad is the problem? We know that right now we spend over $500 billion a year taking care of these particular problems. One in three Americans have either prediabetes or diabetes. One in three. That's unacceptable. Cardiovascular disease is responsible for one in every three deaths in this country. To tackle diabetes, the AMA has launched an innovative partnership with the YMCA. Yep, the place you guys learned how to swim, work out, so forth and so on. The Y has developed a diabetes prevention program that evolves working with a trained lifestyle coach and peer groups to develop healthy eating, physical activity habits, and maintaining them over a one-year period. A recent study estimates that the program could reduce the incidence of diabetes among participating seniors by more than one-third. So we're working with the Y to raise awareness about prediabetes amongst our colleagues and to assist them in referring patients with prediabetes to a diabetes prevention program at their local Y. They're going to create feedback loops, make this part of the treatment plan, make it something that's part of my care that I'm providing to my particular patient. Not just here, you're overweight, you don't eat right, you need to go work out, lose weight, eat better, eat more lettuce, and I'll see you in three months. That isn't going to cut it. We've got to do a better job of connecting the dots and making sure they're getting the care that we need. And we are now engaging practices in Delaware, uh, Indiana, and Minnesota to work on this approach with pilot studies, and we'll have more information in the near future. <coughs> Tackling cardiovascular disease, hypertension. You know, right now, there are 30 million people in this country with access to health care who have poorly controlled hypertension. Now, I know how to diagnose hypertension, and I know how to treat hypertension. So what's the problem? What's missing? What's needed in the elixir, if you will, to make sure that these folks get their blood pressure controlled? And right now, we're testing a framework of 10 diverse clinical sites in Illinois and Maryland working with Johns Hopkins Medicine in working to understand what clinical care changes what must we make in order to get this remedied in this country. We're going to promote this program across the United States once we get it done, but it will be based on information, good knowledge, sound information, and stuff that's really going to make a difference in this country. Now, again earlier you heard about we have to change medical education. You know, it's amazing. We were all Flexner trained, most of us. Um, and I thought I got a pretty good education, actually. Uh, but you know, right now, 
our whole health system is changing and how we educate young men and women has to change as well. Right now, MD graduates need a lot of on-the-job training after they go to work, after they get out of their programs of training, to bring them up to speed in the realities of practicing medicine today. You know, our training and education has got to be competency-based, not calendar-based. It's got to be more efficient. <coughs> if someone knows they want to be an ophthalmologist, do they, in fact, have to take some of these other requirements? Can they not be more programmed, more forward-moving in their training program? We're looking at that. We're evaluating that. And last June, the AMA awarded $11 million in AMA grants to 11 schools who are looking at innovation. They already started doing the work. They needed a bit of financial help to move them to the starting lineup and get going on many of these uh, topics. These curricula that they're looking at are focusing on key areas and disciplines that will become important cornerstones in the future delivery system, including chronic disease, chronic health management issues, population health. I was recently, not long ago, visiting a physician in Georgia, and I was talking with him and a group of physicians gathered together about you know, what we needed to be doing around med medical education and what we needed to be doing amongst our own practices. And I used the word population health. And this gentleman stood up and he banged on the table and he said, I don't care about population health. I just care about my patients. And I thought, boy, have we got a huge disconnect in this country that we have to reckon with. And we're doing it, we'll be doing it in a much of our medical school training programs. The concept of team-based care, physician-led team-based care, and the widespread use of health information technologies, so very vital in the medical practice today. So these schools are working together as a consortium, if you will, sharing experience, strategies, understanding what they're doing, how they're doing it, how we can implement much of this nationally. It isn't going to happen overnight. But I will tell you right now, we're already being able to see some incremental small changes. One, at one of, a meeting, one of the consortium meetings in the fall, the energy there was palpable. They were so excited. I will tell you there were a lot of young academic physicians in teaching programs just delighted to be involved in this. Notice I said they were young. They understand where change has to be made and how it has to be made. And I ask one of them, how long do you think it's going to take before we, in fact, see this change evolving? And one young man looked at me and he says, it already is. We're beginning to see small changes in what is happening in medical education. There's a lot out there to be done. Uh, it's not easy. But we're exploring these innovations, working with these <coughs> medical schools, and we will be understanding in a much better way what it's going to take. And they're all different. They're all looking at different models. We're also encouraging them to look at electronic medical records to understand the value of those, what they need to be doing with those tools as we teach young men and women how to be future doctors. And then I'm going to spend now some time talking about what we call physician satisfaction. Somebody raised the question earlier up in there. Um, I wouldn't tell my children to be a doctor. 55% of physicians say I wouldn't tell my children to become a physician. That's scary and it's frightening. And I think as we look now at uh, new payment models, delivery models of care, Physician satisfaction is going to become even more important. So why is physician satisfaction important? What difference does it make or matter to you? Physician burnout is associated with not only diminished patient satisfaction, but it also contributes to reduced adherence to treatment plans. If you go into a doctor's office and your doctor is about ready to <clears throat> do a face down because he or she is exhausted, unhappy, miserable, you're not going to get the kind of care you really want or need. 
So in the end, it actually results in increased costs as well. So we began partnering with the RAND Corporation a little over two years ago, looking at a variety of physician practices across the country, actually 30 of them, six states, big practices, little practices, specialty, non-specialty. And we published the findings last year. The key takeaway was the level of frustration physicians are feeling about the many obstacles that interfere with patient care. That is, they became physicians in order to help patients, but they have less and less time available to do that, which they also worry is having an effect on patient care. They told us cumbersome electronic health records are costly, time-consuming, and detract from face-to-face -face interaction with the patient. The amount of time physicians must spend on clerical work and regulatory compliance continues to grow. There's not enough autonomy in structuring clinical activities. Uncertainty about the delivery systems and payment models set in motion by the Affordable Care Act. There are also concerns about the move towards consolidation, which I will discuss in just a few minutes. These findings didn't shock many individual physicians, but partnering with the RAND Corporation helped us raise the public dialogue surrounding physician satisfaction. In fact, it led to hundreds of media accounts which is very good, but I think more importantly for me and most physicians who read this report, 150 pages of it, it codified what we all instinctively knew was happening to physicians and practices throughout our country. So we didn't just stop with a survey. We actually have gone on now to do some real solid work around how we're gonna tackle some of these problems. I show you these quotes. I think it talks about the sentiment that many physicians feel. This is uh, part of the RAND report. And you know what their concerns are. It's very meaningful. And I would encourage you, if you are interested in this, to go look up the RAND report and read it. 150 pages. It's not a hard read. But it will tell you something that I think will, if you're in the healthcare industry, if you are a physician, will help you understand where we are on this and why we want to do something about the problem. <coughs> so we talked about regulatory burdens and productivity goals and you know, lack of autonomy in the new delivery systems. So what are we doing about it? There are a number of areas where most physician offices have an opportunity to streamline operations. Physicians can free up their schedules by taking advantage of expanded rooming, empowering a nurse or medical assistant to take responsibility, let them be part of the team delivering the care for much of the standardized workflow from patient check-in to discharge from the office. Another opportunity, pre-visit planning. You know, how many of you have had your doctor's office call you in advance and say, why don't you come in, let's get some lab work done, I know what your problems are, that way we can talk about it when you're in the office, rather than by having to play phone tag with you for three days to be sure you get the information that you need on your laboratory reports. You know, it's very important that we, at the same time, are making the efficiency better. We are actually increasing the time the physician can spend with the patient. That's the important thing. Getting rid of the regulatory administrative burdens allowing me to do what I do best, which is to take care of the patients. Now, one of the more troubling elements in the RAND report, which again came as no particular surprise to us, was the electronic health record. I will tell you right now, we were amazed at the amount of vitriol associated with um, EHRs, very scary. Physicians do see the value. Only about 5% would go back entirely to paper records. But working with today's costly and imperfect systems are causing some very major headaches. The AMA has been pushing for improvements to Medicare's certified EHR systems, 
plus longer timelines to meet meaningful use requirements and revisions to the requirements themselves. And we've been able to get a much needed one year extension on stage two before we all have to move to something else. You know, doctors love technology, but when my computer won't talk to anybody else in the city and we're sharing the same patient, that's a problem. When that computer, in fact, causes me to have to spend three or four hours at the end of my office day inputting data into it, as opposed to taking care of the patient, that's a problem. You know, and it's one thing to mandate and regulate what we all must do around EMRs and electronic health records. But if, it doesn't, if it's not suitable for my practice or my specialty, it isn't gonna work. So we've got more work we have to do around EHRs. You know, you simply can't plug everything into one box and make it work correctly. It's gotta reflect the specialties. It's got to reflect the patient populations that we are particularly taking care of. And it's got to allow us the, you know, to be flexible in how we use an EMR or an electronic health record. You know, if, if everybody, if the EHR has to be all things to all people, the lawyers, the insurance company, the auditors, you name it, it simply diminishes our ability to do the best job we can work, we can do for taking care of our patients. And the C and CMS has got to recognize this and understand where we are headed with this. So that having been said, if you, if you can't figure it out, I'm kind of passionate about how difficult EMRs are for the physicians in this country right now. How in, they interfere, if you're sitting in an exam room with your patient, and there's a computer screen in front of you, and the doctor's looking at the computer screen and not at you, that's a problem. Why is this? What are we gonna do about it? Uh, so we at the AMA are taking on this challenge. We recognize it's gonna take a while, but what we wanna do is get this done correctly for medicine and for our patients. You know, about right now, about 20% of eligible professionals in the Meaningful Use Program have dropped out because of the problems they are having with their electronic health records. And that's not what we want in this country because these records are actually supposedly gonna, these electronic health records are supposedly going to make delivering care better, higher quality, reducing costs, but that's not we, what we are seeing right now. And I will tell you, the vendors here have not been particularly helpful. Uh, and it's been difficult. There are practices that have had to rip and replace their computer programs at their own cost. And it's been a difficult pathway and a lot of time and money wasted in the process. So let me move on now to new payment models. I'm talking about things like accountable care organizations, medical homes, shared savings, bundled payments, and all these are built around two main ideas. First, that the old pay for volume system has outlived the changes in technology in our society that now drive medical care. Second, by banding together, physician-led teams of health professionals can bring about higher quality care, better patient outcomes, and cost savings to our medical system. Right now, CMS is actively studying dozens of pilot uh, studies on shared savings, which I'm very excited to see happening, gain sharing, and the pay for performance programs to see what lives up to its promise of better health care and lower costs. What we're learning from this, I think, is going to provide us a roadmap for the future. I don't think we're in a perfect place by a long shot. We are going to see things evolving and changing appropriately. And so, you know, we've got questions to be asked out there. To what extent have physicians actually begun adopting medical homes, being involved in an ACO, bundled payments? What has been the impact on both physician satisfaction and the quality of care that they are rendering? How are physicians dealing with the sometimes competing demands 
of public and private payers. While the buzz surrounding new payment models continues to grow, there haven't been any comprehensive studies of their impact on physicians. To help answer these questions, we are once again partnering with the RAND Corporation. We are going to study the impact of new payment models on physicians in different practice arrangements and different market dynamics. We look to release this study in early 2015. Keep in mind, however, that the great transition to a new healthcare system is really just getting underway. And even before we see the results, I feel fairly comfortable in predicting that these new payment and delivery systems we are talking so much about today will turn out to be just first steps, if you will, in the evolution of healthcare. And we will see more changes before it is over, believe you me. One thing we do know is that regardless of the specific shape it takes, team-based care will be at the core of medical practice for years to come. The growth of team-based medicine means the move of many physicians to employment, either by a hospital or a large physician group. According to physician recruiter Merritt Hawkins in 2011, 11% of their job offers were for hospital employment. By 2013, that number had risen to 64%, significant. And they predict that 75% 75% of new physician jobs in 2015 will be in hospitals. So this trend toward group employment is real, and it is quite significant. But it is not quite so all-encompassing as the media would have us believe. Here are today's numbers in another format. 13% of physicians are employees of physician-owned groups. 29% are either employed directly by a hospital or in a group owned by a hospital or hospital system. But 5% of the physicians are independent contractors, and more than half of today's physicians, 53%, are still full or part-time owners of a practice. And while we are looking at employment trends, it is important to look, look at age. 42% of US physicians, that's almost half of us, are now over the age of 55 years of age. We're getting old. So change is coming to the physician ranks, one way or the other. A comment on this as well. In our enthusiasm to change how and where care is going to be provided in this country, let us beware of the unintended consequences. Private practices, small practices, small groups must be able to thrive and continue to grow in our country because one community is one community. They don't all look alike. We cannot all be jammed into the same box. It simply will not work. In rural eastern Kentucky, a small practice is what the patients need and want. It's what the hospital wants. It's what city government wants. It's different from urban Chicago. We have to recognize that variability and recognize that one size simply does not fit all. So let's go a little bit beyond the numbers. The reasons physicians give for choosing employment, either with a larger physician-led group or a hospital, are that it frees them from dealing with the health care bureaucracy. You know, the federal government has this methodology of if something isn't right, let's just layer something else on top of what's going on right now. Surely that will fix it, won't it? It doesn't work that way. And at the end of the day, the physicians and the practices are still out there trying to you know, slog through the bureaucracy that is impeding us every day. 
and they, they go for employment because they think it gives them more flexibility in providing higher quality care and more efficient care and better value. Younger physicians who opt for hospitals also say hospitals offer higher compensation to start. An important consideration if you come out of medical school with $150,000 debt. They, they cite lifestyle as a reason as well. But the move to hospital employment is not for everyone and has raised a number of issues for the medical community. Many physicians are uneasy about hospital employment. They worry about the loss of their professional autonomy. They have less influence in decision making. And they have concerns over a variety of bottom line hospital requirements, including requirements to see high numbers of patients or funnel referrals to a set list of specialists when they don't think it is in the best interest of their patient. How physicians practice also has a significant impact on local communities. Right now, just here in Illinois, 29,617 patient care physicians in this state support the following. 137,424 direct jobs. They create 50.9 billion in sales revenue. 27.9 billion in wages and benefits. And 2.1 billion in state and local tax revenues. Now, while these numbers do include physicians in hospital settings, the threat of losing independent physician businesses is very real in two communities across our nation. There is also apprehension on both sides, if you will, physicians and hospital management, about how the two can be successfully integrated, given the differences in training and culture. In a few years, will hospitals have bought up all the physician practices, essentially limiting options open to physicians? Or will physicians form accountable care organizations either alone or, as we heard, with insurance providers? If that happens, will they be pay playing hospitals off, you know, once it, off one another in the process? Or perhaps insurance providers will manage to get the upper hand over both physicians and the hospitals. Who knows? Questions of serious nature. And what about the physicians who are employees? How will they react in the long run if they have no voice in running the institution? One conclusion might be a passive aggressive work group who, who just goes by the clock. I'm checking in, I'm checking out. We saw this in the past, in the 90s, with HMOs. They lost some of their desire to hang in there. Let's see that last patient, even if it is later in the day. I'm on the clock now, I'm going home. Or could you envision all these physician employees joining together in anger and resentment to form a doctor's union? If there's a possibility for NCAA athletes, why not doctors? Scares me to death. It's already happening with nurses in some states. And then there's the other side of the coin, the hospital side. Hospitals are going to have to loosen up a little bit and let doctors in at a higher level than you are used to. And that may be a tough step for hospital administrators. I've already said that many physicians are uncomfortable with the idea of hospital employment in great numbers. Hospital leaders are also uncomfortable with these changes, but they're not quite sure what to do next. Whatever happens will also involve the payers, but since patient care actually occurs at the intersection between doctors and hospitals, that is the focus of my concern. You know, the AMA, is, believes it is possible to forge a relationship that works for physicians, for hospitals, and for our patients. But it will require, will require some form of integrated leadership, 
arrangement between the physicians and the hospital to provide highly motivated physicians, high quality care, good patient outcomes at a reasonable cost. No one has come up with the right answer. We're still working on that one. But the AMA and the American Hospital Association recently held a joint leadership conference on new models of care. This will blow your mind. It was our first meeting of the AMA with the H AHA in over 35 years. What took so long? An excellent opportunity to begin to understand the many ways physicians and hospitals can be more collaborative. The first meeting produced a clear call for more and broader physician leadership roles in hospital management, regardless of whether physicians are employees or part of an affiliated practice. And a call to develop empowered physician organizations capable of responsibility and accountability beyond the traditional organized medical staff in our hospitals. So let's talk a little bit about structuring for the future. We believe the institutional structure should include the following to best achieve success. Number one, integrated physician and hospital administrative leadership plus hospital management that is present at all levels and in all management decisions. True management teams that are accountable to and for each other and can speak for one another as well. An equal participatory partnership built on trust. This is absolutely crucial. Physicians need to trust in the good faith and the ability of the hospital leadership and vice versa. Open sharing of clinical and business information across the continuum of care. But these relationships are not just going to materialize out of nowhere. We are all creatures of two different cultures with different sets of priorities and expectations. For true integration to be accomplished, two things must occur. Both physicians and hospitals must share a philosophical alignment and a number of barriers need to be broken down. Hospitals and physicians need to go into the relationship with similar expectations, goals aligned from top to bottom with appropriate metrics, shared responsibility to meet the budget, satisfy patients, and achieve those quality metrics that we all shiver when we hear about, and the authority to make it actually happen. So what are the barriers to these successes? These include differing mindsets. Physicians and hospital administrators often assess problems differently and propose differing solutions due to different training and perspectives. These differing viewpoints can lead to strained relations. We have seen this happen time and time again across our country. Having mutual respect despite these differing points of views is key to implementing a successful model of care. Right now, not enough physicians have the training and leadership and management skills required for successful integrated leadership of healthcare facilities. We have to change that. An important next step will be to determine where this training should take place, what it should be in medical schools, residency training programs, organized delivery systems, or any combination of these. There is a similar lack of capable physician organizations. It's going to take a dedicated expertise and capital to develop self-governing, business-focused physician organizations as quickly as we need them. 
Another issue is adoption of these new payment models. The transition away from payment for volume and toward payment for value hopefully will catalyze the development of physician hospital leadership integration. But before this can happen, <coughs> payers must expand their willingness to engage in these new payment models. Legal and regulatory issues will also come up as physician hospital integration becomes a reality. Solving these issues may well take advocacy work with state and federal governments to amend or repeal existing laws. There's a lot of work to be done in that area. Something else that will have to be resolved as new physician hospital relationships evolve are the many employed physicians' current contracts, either directly through hospitals, through outside staffing firms, or other arrangements. Finally, the traditional hospital governing board organized medical staff model is codified in law in most states, but these groups provide value and should not go away anytime soon. Yet as new integrated leadership physician organizations develop, we will need to find ways to coordinate the two without either conflict or unnecessary duplication of effort. These barriers I have just described are not small issues by a long shot. There are many steps between the fragmented systems we have today to a true partnership between physicians and hospitals. That is also true, incidentally, as we strive to work with a variety of healthcare professionals to create highly functioning accountable care organizations, primary care medical homes, home care models, whatever the animal turns out to be. And we know that creating the new world of integrated medical care will not be simple or easy. You know, it's very easy to talk about it. Isn't this the ideal thing we should be doing? But actually moving the Queen Mary is very difficult in this particular area. The, the past three and a half years since the Affordable Care Act have not been simple or easy. We are all learning to adapt, not to just to new ways of doing things, but to new ways of thinking. And this is very hard to do. It is hard on physicians, as you have just heard. It's hard on our patients and our medical institutions as well. It's hard on our medical students, who've got to learn about things changing every day. What they thought they knew yesterday is worth nothing tomorrow as they walk out the door. But we've got to make changes. Change is a good thing. Change is not done easily. It can be painful occasionally. But we have got to do it. This country will have higher quality care and better outcomes for our patients, delivered more efficiently, by more satisfied physicians at lower costs if we get this right. This is very much the same goal that Dr. Nathan Davis had in mind when he founded the AMA in 1847. We believe that a, a future is worth working for and will continue to do so, and one that Dr. Davis, I hope, would be very proud of. This is a different AMA. It's an evolving AMA. It's an organization which is now taking on three major issues in our country of great importance. Improving health outcomes, accelerating change in medical education, and looking at practice sustainability and physician satisfaction in our country. Will there be enough doctors to go around? My answer is yes. We have more medical schools, more medical students more patients, there will be more doctors. We have got issues around training programs, funding of training programs, we can talk about that offline. But we do have the demand and we must meet that demand and we will do so. So I thank you again for the opportunity of joining you today. 
uh, and have a great session this afternoon. Thank you. I'm advised we have time for a few questions. You may not like the answer. Yes, ma'am. Expound on that? Yes. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. The question was about quality, yeah, quality metrics. metrics. And your the challenge we've got in this country is that we have started out with measuring, you know, measuring things is a good thing. If you don't measure, you don't know what's happening, so forth and so on. What has happened in this country is that we have promulgated the development of measurements that are all over the place. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. Do they improve health care? Do they improve health outcomes? And what we really have to do is shift from measuring for measuring only and checking a box to say, I've done this, to in fact looking at the health outcome. Are my patients actually better off? Are they healthier? And in fact, that trend is underway now. I actually sit on the National Quality Forum. And what we are seeing, and I've seen this, this huge, gigantic bucket of measurements evolving over the last decade in particular, and now we're moving away from some of this rote, what I call rote measurement work, to improving health outcomes. And that's the, those are the measures that are appropriate, simply not layering on more measurement for measurement's sake. The AMA actually in 2000 founded the Physician Consortium for Performance Improvement, and that was in fact one of the major startup actions around measure development, using physicians and all members of the healthcare teams together putting out the measurements, but we, we have now transitioned, I think, to, to better looking at health outcomes. What's best? Is health improved? Simply checking the box isn't gonna do it. That's, that's why I say that. Yes, sir. Could you comment on the AMA's position regarding ICD-10 and the spirit of predictions? <laughs> so I was really hoping I could present to a group and not have to mention the word ICD-10. <laughs> but that obviously is not the case. So um, ICD-10 is been held in abeyance for another year uh, simply because of the fact that uh, the SGR uh, patch went into place rather than repeal. And this is kind of a mixed blessing because there are many practices, academic medical centers have already invested tons of dollars and so much time getting ready for ICD-10. So the other side of the coin is you've got other practices that aren't ready, so they've got another year to take a deep breath. Um, right now, we have been very hopeful that there would be a period of end-to-end -end testing uh, in, uh, actually in July on ICD-10. Uh, I think that's been put on hold right now because of the delay. So we're still sort of sitting in Never Never Land around ICD-10. Uh, many pra I'm very concerned about the practices that have already had to do the work and have done the work and they're ready to go. Uh, on the other hand, the AMA has tried to make information and tools and understanding and education available to physicians and practices so that it can happen. Uh, you know, the problem with ICD-10, and you asked the question because you're probably quite aware of it, we go from something like 17,000 codes to 68,000 codes. Nine for parrot bites. A couple for things falling from outer space. ICD-10 is a very granular coding system. And it is touted as being important for improving quality and getting more evidence and research data, so forth and so on. But every country takes the ICD-10 information and adapts it to their own particular needs. I still don't understand why in the United States we need 68,000 codes, whereas in Canada they've only got about, they're using ICD-10, they've got 17,000 codes, and I don't think the populations are all that different. Uh, so I think part of the challenge here is working our way through the granularity of this thing. The other problem with this for many practices is going to be, there was about two years ago a study done in which they took experienced coders and had them do some work around ICD-10 you know what the accuracy rate was? 62%. That's unacceptable. I mean, because what happens is, if the accuracy is that low, the payments are gonna get paid, 
huge delays on the government side. Practices are going to be in, you know, in the red before they can turn around. So there are a lot of issues around this whole entity. And you know, we keep working. We keep working. We keep working. <laughs> Political, right. So why? I mean, there's so much subjectivity trying to make objective measures of these. You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. We, you know, yeah. Unfortunately, the, when the lobbyists and the lobbyists they don't understand the burden. It's, it's a huge financial burden. It's a huge financial burden. We actually at the AMA did a study uh, just recently on the cost of, of going to ICD-10. And in the, it was compared to data from 2008. And uh, what, what happened was the cost actually tripled for practices, big ones and little ones, tripled in cost to institute ICD-10. And uh, you know, that's an unfunded mandate. It's got to come out of your own pocket. And so this is another huge issue. We have been able to, over the last 10 years, do some, some really aggressive stalling around ICD-10. Uh, this is something that uh, the federal government is going to have to deal with. Congress is going to have to deal with it. Your legislators need to hear about it if you're challenged with this issue and, and deal with it. But it is a difficult issue. And granted, we understand this very, very compellingly. One more question I'm allowed. Yes, ma'am. Ah, wonderful question. Um, in fact, we do spend a lot of time talking about the importance of end-of-life care, the importance of physicians talking with their patients from the get-go on the front line. We have had policy for a long time around the importance of end-of-life care, the patient and the patient's family making sure the doctor and the team of physicians understand their wishes uh, and so forth and so on. In fact, we, we kind of took it in the head when the death panels things erupted around the Affordable Care Act because we do, we do propose, we do have literature, we do have advocacy resource available on end-of-life care, the quality of it. And I am a big proponent. I'm an HIV care specialist. And one of the first things I used to do when my patients would come in, now this was some time ago, we would talk about end-of-life. What do you really want? What do you want from me? When such and such happens, what can I do to make your days better quality? And wonderful conversations. That should happen right now, and that conversation should happen on a regular basis, not just once in the career of that patient with that physician. This should be something being talked about with some regularity. You know, like, let's talk about this again. Has, has anything changed? Has your health changed? Do you have desires or wishes? But we do have and are very strong proponents of this type of working relationship with the patient and their families around end of life care issues and making that care the best it can possibly be. Thank you very much. Thank you.